it has been defined as the unpredictable and capricious nature of chance or fate. I, in, in all honesty, um, some of you will find this humorous. This is where I, I first heard the expression. Back from 1968 to 73, the Wo Rowan and Martin Laugh-In Show. Some of us will remember that's where we were all introduced to Goldie Hawn. It became a, a regular part of their weekly feature. But back before that, it actually appeared um, in a movie under the title of El Dido del Destino, also known as The Fickle Finger of Fate, starring Tab Hunter, under the subtitle of Who Got the Finger. So in my research to, to find out sort of the background and the history of that expression, it took me back even further. A Neil Simon Broadway production called Sweet Charity. The, the, the main star of this show, it was one of her favorite expressions. But even back before that in 1963, educational television at its best, McHale's Navy, where Captain Bingington was, was talking to Ensign Parker and saying, well, the, 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 the fickle finger seems to have got us again. And Parker said, what finger is that? And he said, the finger of fate. But even before that, I have read that uh, it was an Americanism that was used on college campuses in the 1930s. And unfortunately, it was borrowed by soldiers during World War II, where it was tied with another word and says, we've been by the fickle finger of fate, and they didn't use a nice word. Uh, I even learned that, that you can actually buy the flying fickle finger of fate um, award that was used on the Rowan Martin show for twelve hundred dollars. I I, I, stopped, I start there because the the journey, the spiritual journey of of serving God, um, is is anything but easy, and it's easy to see because no two journeys, even serving serving God, are exactly the same because there are twists and turns and unforeseen things that happen and come up. That, that would easily distract or derail or detract or get you off course. And so for that reason, with, with this as the background, the fickle finger of fate, is we're simply entitling today's study in Acts chapter 14, Staying the Course. Because when the fickle finger of fate sort of comes your way and throws you a curve, sometimes the hardest thing to do is stay the course. So take your Bibles and follow along as we spend our time in Acts chapter 14. And we're going to have to, to, to move through this rapidly because, uh, frankly, we've got a lot of ground to cover and, and I just now started my, my timer. So being able to stay the course means knowing that faithfulness isn't defined by success. And, and this is a hard thing for those of us who grew up in Western civilization where everything in life is, is, is measured by success and failure. So let's look at this passage, Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, to, to show that, that, that change, the result of spiritual change, invites challenge. Let's read verses 1 and 2. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together. This is Paul and Barnabas. And spoke in such a way that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brothers. I, I would actually want to, to say that, that serving, serving the Lord, that if you're hoping to do something to be effective and make a splash, you can't make a splash without making waves. And so here Paul and Barnabas, they've had to leave one place because of because of what the Lord did there, and they're making their way on this circuit in his first missionary journey. And, the, and they come to a new place, and they go where they go to the synagogue, the, the common place to meet people. And there they share, and, and they get an audience, and they get a hearing, and there is a response that people believe. But it doesn't go well with everyone. Not everyone is excited about what God does in the life of people who've been touched by the Spirit of God. It, it's sort of interesting, and, and this is one of the challenges of, 
of, of ministry and one of the challenges of serving the Lord and trying to be faithful day in and day out. The, the, the general population will celebrate a drunk who gets sober by the power of God, but they won't celebrate it when the drunk starts preaching, telling them that they all need Jesus as well. So, so staying the course means knowing that faithfulness isn't defined and maybe this is by somebody else's measure of success, knowing that, that change that is an inevit inevitable result of, of the work of God through anyone. It doesn't have to be a preacher or a missionary. It can be, it can be you. It can be the, the, the hairdresser you've built a relationship with, or your neighbor, or a, a friend you play ball with, that when you have that chance to share the gospel and, and the Lord gets hold of them and begins that, that internal, external work of the Spirit, then it's going to raise some eyebrows and not everyone is going to celebrate the new birth that's taken place. But also miracles can change lives actually without changing hearts. Continue our reading in verse 3. Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be performed by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews, while others with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to treat them abusively and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding region. It's, it's sort of a remarkable thing because we know that, that most people, they thrive on, the, on the, just the very idea of the miraculous. Uh, God intervening in time and space, doing something in the lives of people. But as evidence in this passage, here Paul and Barnabas have been granted this, and, and we don't have any details outstanding. It was probably healings of some kind, blind who had their eyes restored, lame, uh, made to walk again. That in the, in the very presence of people preaching the gospel, an interested crowd, a, a, a sort of a unpleasant reaction, the evidence of God in their lives and their ministry doing the miraculous, changing lives didn't mean that their, their hearts were changed as well. So much so that the reaction was people started talking about doing bodily injury to these disciples, these apostles. And they decided it's time to move on up the road to take it someplace else. You see, as, as, as much as people want to see the miraculous, sensationalism it's like any other drug. And one of the things I learned by hanging out in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous, and that is that one is too many and a thousand is not enough. When it comes to the miraculous, people are never, never satisfied with the last thing that God has done. They're expecting Him to do more. They just don't want Him to do too much that they don't sign off on. So miracles can change lives without changing hearts. And then faithfulness is a calling, not a stat sheet. In verse 7, and there, after they, they moved on up the road, and there Paul and Barnabas continued to preach the gospel. If, if, you, were to, if you were using a box score to, to track um, what the apostles were doing or what, what Paul and Barnabas were able to do, you'd say they went to such and such a city, they had an opportunity to preach, they had some strikes, they had some hits, they had some home runs, and they had some outs, and at some point they got thrown out of the game. And it's left to you to decide whether their ministry was a success or not. In God's eyes, and this isn't just important for them, this is important for, for us as well, is that, that faithfulness in ministry is, is not a stat sheet. It's not a score sheet. It's, it's not about how many wins and losses you have. Faithfulness staying the course is about staying the course because that's what God has called us to. And we're not going to be measured by God based on what other people think we have done, whether right or wrong. God is the one who's keeping the score sheet of His own. And his question is, did you do what I sent you to do? Did you go where I sent you to go? Did you speak to who I sent you to speak to? And when you were finally rejected, did you simply pick up and move on so that somebody else can hear? 
So, so, you know, staying the course requires those things. Number two, it means knowing that the temptation of celebrity is real in verses 8 through 18. First, that, that our fallen nature thrives on attention. Our fallen nature thrives on attention. Verse 8, in Lystra, a man was sitting whose feet were incapacitated. He had been disabled from his mother's womb and had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, and Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be made well. And he said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet! And the man leaped up and began to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come, become like men, and have come down to us. <laughs> given what has transpired in, in, in the previous chapters, and even at the beginning of this chapter, where they, they, they come to another synagogue, they, they get a hearing, some people respond, but there's this adverse reaction to them, and, and God uses them to perform miracles, and yet the miracles are not enough, and people are so upset, they're talking about doing them bodily harm. They go to the next place, and they start teaching, and, and they start preaching, and they get this hero's welcome. <laughs> the gods have come down among us. I don't, I don't care who you are. Um, the tougher the journey has been, the longer the road has been, the harder the battles have been, when somebody comes along and they want to celebrate who you are and what you're doing, even if they don't understand what it is, there's something in your spirit and in your nature going, stop it, stop it, stop it, tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> Our fallen nature thrives on attention. It's the reason why we have watched um, in, in our lifetime how God has, has taken and raised up men and women into positions of opportunity. He's taken people out of nowhere. He's given them a voice. He's given them a platform. He's given them an opportunity. And they have become instruments of His grace and His peace to preach the gospel to sing the gospel, to celebrate the gospel, and they have become rich and famous and fallen. I, I'm not going to attempt to, to enumerate how many people, but you know, I could certainly, in a short order, go through and, and count one person for every finger on both of my hands who have fallen into that trap. As long as they were on the receiving end of rejection, and people not believing in what they were doing, they stayed the course. But when they found fertile ground for them to be elevated as what? A celebrity saint. The, the sound of that music on their ears resonated with something in their soul, but it was their fallen nature that it resonated with. And so don't mistake in thinking that Paul and Barnabas didn't like that moment and what was taking place. After where they had been, and what they had done, and what they had experienced, it sounds like finally, 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 we're going to have an opportunity to see God do great things. Our fallen nature thrives on attention. Second, being the toast of the town beats being toast any day. Verses 12 and 13. And then they, the citizens, began calling Barnabas Zeus. And Paul, Hermes, since he was the chief speaker. Moreover, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. Being the toast of the town beats being toast any day. I'm not sure what more that I can really say about that other than then I get it. In, in my, you know, 40-something years of ministry, um, I, I, I'm, I made more than a few waves. Um, I made more than a few people happy. I more, made more than a few people really, really, really mad. And I got invited out of town more than a few times. 
And those of, those a few occasions, and usually it happened early on in a ministry. You, you may not know this, but when a preacher goes to a new church or to a new place, they, he has what's known as a honeymoon season. Usually it, it will last a, about one year. That's when he can't do any wrong. And he likes it. Listen, he's, he's the toast of the town. They love him. They, they laugh at his jokes. They think he's brilliant. They talk about his scholarship and how spiritual he is and what a man of God he is. But then that first year passes and the honeymoon ends and, and then the second year comes. But in our, in our heart of hearts, the thing that we have to guard against is that desire for, for us to have all men speak well of us. When knowing that speaking the truth sooner or later is going to rub somebody the wrong way. But in this case, you, you have this, these people being hailed as, as heroes, as, as, as gods coming to the flesh. And the local priest who celebrated the temple of, of these gods, wanted to bring and, and, and do public sacrifices with a, with a community for Paul and for Barnabas. And, and I'm pretty sure Paul, Paul and Barnabas were, they were a little taken aback. Something in their spirit goes, man, this is really cool. I like this, but this is all wrong. So spiritual surrender isn't a popular message. Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard about it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, preaching the gospel to you, to turn from these useless things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. In past generations, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. In that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And even by saying these things, only with difficulty did they restrain the crowd from offering sacrifices to them. The gospel message um, it, it's a great message. It's a message of what? Of hope, of forgiveness, of peace, of opportunity, of eternity. But it's also a call to what? To surrender. It's a call to, to die to self. It's a, tall, it's a call to self-sacrifice. And as long as people hear about what God is going to do for them, they're all about his gift and his grace. But when the message becomes a message about, what, self-denial, for Paul to say to these people who are, who are calling them gods and wanting to sacrifice to them, stop it, stop it, stop it. This is the very thing that we're talking about. God came to save you from worshiping idols that are not gods offering sacrifices to that which is not real. This is not what God has called you to. And with great difficulty, were they able to restrain the crowd from what? Exercising their pagan practices, trying to include these missionaries in their experiences. And any time you, you tell a person or a people, as graciously as you can, that what they're doing is not what pleases God, that he has a better plan for them. You're inviting potential grief because you've crossed the line in offending that which they value so very much. The third thing is that, that it means staying the course, means knowing that it ain't over until it's over. Just when you think it can't get any worse. Verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking that he was dead. Some of you heard me tell this story before, but until I can come up with, until I can remember a better one from my past, um, to, to learn to never ask the question, can it possibly get any worse? Or how can it get any worse? Stan Graham, uh, if you're watching this, Stan, God, God bless you. I have a lot of good memories with you. Uh, Stan and I were playing golf at Forest Park Golf Course in, in the western part of Baltimore. 
And Stan is a superb golfer. It's, it's, it's revolting. You know, he doesn't know how to play bad golf, and I don't know how to play good golf. But he played with me anyway. And so we'd played around, and we'd got, we got down to the 18th hole. And the 18th hole was a par 5 that ran right along Forest Park Boulevard. And so we stand up at the tee box, and he tees off. And, of course, he hits this beautiful drive down the middle of the fairway, you know, toward the, where the green is. And I ha I've, had the, I've had the absolutely most horrible round uh, of, of the day. I can't hit anything. Um, it, it's been an absolute mess. And so I think, I don't have anything to lose. And I get up on the tee box, and I put my ball down there, and I ask the question, I might as well give it all I've got. How much worse can it get? Well, I just found out. I hit the ball. I hit it hard. And I hit it well. And that ball hooked up the fairway over to the street and hit the bottom center of the windshield on an approaching vehicle. We stood there in the car, slowed down and slowed down and slowed down and finally stopped over by where the tee box was. And I went over to talk to the driver. It was a Red Cross worker that was late to work who had just dropped the insurance on her car. How much worse can it get? That's pretty bad. Thank goodness State Farm and my homeowner's insurance actually paid to replace that windshield. Asking the question, how much worse can it get? So here's Paul and Barnabas. They're, they're making their way. They're trying to follow the Lord's leads on these places to go and to preach the gospel. They go to the local synagogue to, to try to connect with the local Jewish population there, to, to open up the, the Old Testament passage about prophecy in Jesus, to introduce people to Jesus. And they usually get a response and then they get a reaction, and they have to leave town. And they finally come into a place where they, they don't get to the synagogue. They come in, and, and as a result of, of, of God's using them in that context, and people seeing the miracles they're performing, they assume that this is, these are gods in the flesh. Sacrifices are attempted to be made, calling them Zeus and Hermes, and Paul and Barnabas restrain the crowd from doing that. And then troublemakers from their last stop arrive on the scene. Here, here's this festive crowd being restrained from offering sacrifices, celebrating the presence of these men that seem bigger than life because of what they can do. And here's the crowd that comes into town and goes, there they are, there are those troublemakers, those teachers of strange gods, those promoters of evil ways. How much worse can it get? You go from on the one hand being deified music to your ears and on the other hand being drug out of town and the very crowd that was saying hail the conquering heroes are saying stone them to death. You see, staying the course means knowing that it ain't over until it's over. Just when you think it can't get any worse. Maybe that needs to be a part of the discipleship methods message when you first introduce somebody to Jesus. You know, you talk about forgiveness of sin, you welcome to the family of God, you talk about spending eternity with them, you introduce them to reading the Gospels, and you put them on a plan of discipleship and studying the Scripture and, and walking the walk of faith. But then a part of that education needs to be, here is the fickle finger of fate. Just when you think things can't get any worse, they actually can. And you need to be prepared for God's sufficiency through that as well. The Lord never said it was going to be easy. He just said it was going to be possible. Gut checks then are routine to faithfulness. Verse 20, but while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. And the next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. We, we, can't, we can't imagine for us the, the idea of, of a public stoning, people picking up rocks that are big enough to throw and throwing them at a standing human being until they're a stooping human being, until they're a laying on the ground human being, with big cracks in their flesh, blood coming out every which way, big lumps on their head, 
and they're still not moving and and there are enough rocks laying on them and there are enough broken flesh on them that the conclusion of the crowd is the job is done we'll have no more problem with them they are dead and if you're one of the disciples either one traveling with Paul and Barnabas or whether you're one of the new converts who accepted the message and, and you're there in this community and you're watching your friends and your neighbors and your relatives turn into this, this bloodthirsty mob and, and attempt to kill these strangers and the crowd dissipates, some happy because of what they've done, some turn away in disgust and there may be a few that were throwing up in the bushes because this was more than they bargained for and when the, when the crowd dissipates and you're one of those disciples and you gather around this body of Paul, what are you feeling in your heart? Are you feeling anger? Probably. But you're probably broken hearted. You're probably overwhelmed with a sense of grief and loss. We didn't see that coming. Why didn't we see that coming? What could we have done to have stopped that, to have prevented that, to have avoided that, to have spared our brother's life? You're standing there trying to figure out what to do now and what to do next and how to process it all and, and, and what this means for you and God's call and claim on your life. And, and you hear a sound. Ugh. And you look down and you see first a finger moving. And then you see a hand moving. And you realize he's not dead. And you stoop down and you clear the rocks away from his body. And, and you take pieces of, of your own clothing and, and you begin to, to treat his wounds, to write, wipe the bud, blood from his, his face and to assess whether he has any bones broken or not. And you're asking him to make sure that he's awake and alert and conscious about what's going on. And, and the amazing thing says, and it says, Paul got up and went back into the city. Cleaned himself up, gathered his things, and he and Barnabas went on up the road to the next place to preach the gospel. You see, gut checks have to be a routine to faithfulness. Because there's going to be easy sledding at times, there's going to be good sledding at times, there's going to be rejection at times, there's going to be anger at times, there's going to be hostility at times, and there may be brutality at times. And the gut check is, are you the kind of follower of Jesus Christ that says, you know what, hmm. when I think about it, this is what Jesus went through for me. Arrested, kangaroo court, mocked, beaten, crown of thorns, spit on, made to drag a cross as far as he could drag it and then somebody else was enlisted to finish the job. And then without any clothing on him, hung to die in public shame and disgrace. Not for himself, but for me. The gut check is, is there anything that I'm going to face in my lifetime in this country that will even begin to compare to that? When I get uh, dissed by somebody because I'm a believer and, and I have a problem with certain sinful practices and conduct, if I speak up for what is morally right, and against what is morally wrong and I experience rejection or somebody makes fun of me or mocks me, the gut check is, am I going to remain true and consistent to what God has called me to knowing that he's called me to serve him under all circumstances at all times that he might be fully represented and the gospel message might be heard. The gut check is what causes a Paul to get up, brush himself off, wipe himself off, 
go back into town, collect his things, and ask the question, so where's our next stop to preach the gospel? And then finally, God's call to service is never ending. It is never ending. Picking up in verse 21. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and made a good number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they entrusted them to the Lord in whom they had believed. God's call to serve never has an expiration date. <laughs> When, when, when people ask me what, what I, I do when I meet somebody for the first time building a relationship, and they say, well, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm, 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 I'm semi-retired uh, as a pastor because there's no such thing as retirement. Because the call of God, when it began in 1974, well, when it was made evident in 1974, it was there before. Uh, simply because I stepped away from the, the full-time pastorate almost four years ago, didn't mean I retired from God's call. God's call follows me here because I'm still called to teach the gospel, to preach the gospel, to build relationships with people, and to continue to what? Disciple those. It's interesting when you see that after he made many disciples, they backtrack and went through the very places where they'd, they'd face trouble and problem and even stoning because there were a few who had come to faith had become disciples, and they went back for their sake to encourage them to stay the course. The story goes, it was September the 8th, 1990, that the Kansas City Royals were, were, were pay, playing the, the Texas Rangers. Um, in, the second, in the second inning at bats was Bo Jackson, the two sports star, Big man, fast man, Nolan Ryan, who was 43 years of age at that time, considered an old man, threw a pitch, and Bo Jackson smacked it right back <laughs> into Nolan Ryan's face. The ball hit, trickled off to the ground in the infield. Nolan Ryan went over, picked it up, and threw Bo Jackson out at first base. And then Nolan Ryan returned to the mound with blood streaming from his mouth on his jersey. Pitching the rest of the game for a win. If you want a picture of staying the course, it's being bloodied but unbowed. Staying in the game until the game is actually over. I'm, uh, before I wrap this up in prayer, um, I, I want to I say that it's interesting to be doing this message about staying the course because today, regardless of when you hear this, uh, I'm actually recording this on March the 25th, which is my 67th birthday. And, um, and I want to go on record as saying, as long as God grants me breath, it doesn't matter how many fastballs get hit back into my face. My plan is to stay the course and to finish the game, to continue to preach the gospel, to build relationships, to share the gospel, and then to disciple those who have responded to the gospel because God's call to service is never, never ending. And regardless of what the fickle finger of fate may bring my way, and trust me, it's bringing plenty my way. I want to be found faithful. So let me, let me pray for you and pray for us. Um, as we resubmit ourselves to being used as instruments of God's peace under all conditions. Father, uh, you alone know how trying it's been for me to, to prepare this message and to, to, to make this recording 
to be posted, be shared with those around the country, around the world. And Lord, my hope is that you will use this to speak to the hearts of, of your, your followers. Those who have said yes to you and, and want to be found faithful. No, they're not called to preach and they're not called to do music, but they are simply called to be faithful witnesses to you wherever they are, under all circumstances and at all times. And that you use this to strengthen their faith, that theirs can be a firm and clear voice, that their life could be a consistent witness, that they could deflect the criticisms, they could ignore the rejections, they could take the abuse knowing that you're capable of raising them up and putting them forward on the road to share with the next person who comes along. Thank you for the privilege of, of this time spent together. And now, Father, grant us the joy in the journey of knowing that the score sheet that you're keeping on our lives is not based on anyone else's idea of success and failure, but on whether you find us faithful to your calling. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Thank you once again for, for tuning in um, to spend this time with us. Um, staying the course um, is about being down, but, but never out. And I hope you can find encouragement from this. I, I want to hear from you, uh, whether you can tell or not, from week to week. There's sometimes when I really struggle in doing this because of the things that are going on in my personal life and around me and the day and the moment. And so I don't, want to, I don't want to burden you with that. I want to come to you with a, a word of encouragement. And so I, I, I want a word of encouragement from you that, that what I'm providing for you is of some help. And if you have suggestions, please let me know this. I always, I'm always glad to hear uh, either Facebook Messenger or you can send me a text or you can send me an email at this email address. And then invited others to share the journey. We're still trying to figure out where all this goes and, and what life has for all of us post-COVID. And I can't wait to be there. Um, we're also available on YouTube if you want to, to be able to go back and look at a range of other things that we have uh, on our Vimeo account. Just let me know and I'll, I'll give you that connection, that online lead as well. Um, and for those of you that want to support the ministry, uh, we have somebody else that has signed on and, and has begun to, to give regularly and I'm grateful for that. Um, we're still working out the technology part to punch a button on this screen, but we'll get there sooner or later. In the meantime, if you want to support this ministry, then you can, you know, simply send a check, either do it through the bank or through the mail and mail it, make it out to Church Rebirth Ministries at this mailing address. And just know that they will go into to the ministry that we look forward to, to what God is going to use us doing in the future. God bless you. Make the most out of your fickle finger of fate.